My name is Larry Herzog. I am the creator, executive producer of Nowhere Man. My name is Art Montrostelli. I am uh, one of the writers and uh, I was the supervising producer of Nowhere Man. You know, one of the things that's so it's interesting to me <laughs> how you came in as they ordered the back nine of the show. And, and uh, certainly, I think, alongside me, had the most affinity for what it was we were doing here. And But whenever I listen to you talk about the show, uh, off screen, on screen, whatever it is, it's, uh, you know, I'm definitely like, foaming at the mouth like this is my life and you have all these wonderful like quotes and your well-read references you know i should take you around with me wherever i go because you make me look smart well they sent me the dvds like six months ago yeah, but you, you just you quote them. like young and all these things i thought when you were quoting young you meant neil young i mean <laughs> i was oh okay. <laughs> nowhere man the collective unconsciousness. I mean, it has to be said uh, for all eternity and record that you and I, I believe, co-wrote this script, but we were at a very dismal point in the uh, very dismal devolution yeah. of the series, and it was so little under my tutelage at this point other than that we conceived of how we wanted the first season to end and we executed these scripts that this is a cycle of episodes, which I kind of consider the last four, or the lost four, to, yeah. at least from my point of view, that I, I can barely say I barely remember them. So this is one, this episode I actually like, but it, it was we're way beyond the beginning and the end because you were sort of disengaging a little bit, and I was trying to do something in this episode, but was never able to communicate to, uh, Looking back, I don't even not, know. I don't remember who the powers to be were, who they were. But, you know, an idea, you know, it was a crazy idea. It wasn't what they wanted to hear. Right. An oh, idea sure. like, actually, if we can pull off Gemini, I'm thinking, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I, we I can get the best of both worlds. They're going to like it because it can continue to be a really cool and creepy thriller. And yet there's some bullshit thing we can tell them. Right, right, and it's right. sort of in right, here, right, right. for me anyway. And yet, a lot of people, like, you know, when they see this episode and when they responded to it in the internet, too, saw, you know, something completely different. I know. And nobody, including, like, Stan and, you know, the suits, no, nobody really got a sense of what it was. You well, know? when Toby and I first were talking about doing the pilot, and I, it was probably bef either during the shooting, before the shooting, it wasn't after, because Toby disappeared pretty quickly afterwards. We were talking about where might the show go, what could be going on, what might not be going on, and the kind of, I mean, it was not something we were seriously playing. Oh my God, he's being chased by the village people. But um, <laughs> it, it, it uh, we kind of came up with that sort of Manchurian candidate concept that perhaps, the reason it was so easy to remove the identity of Tom Vale was because Tom Vale itself right. wasn't a valid identity. So right. despite the pressure all, all season to come up with more of a kind of structured what's going on, what's not going on, um, where we ended up really wasn't any different from the, the initial conversation that uh, that Toby and I had about it. And, you know, I still say that had we set out to do a show that was gonna start in the pilot, like a mystery, and say, someone did this to you, who is it? And then spend a series, which of course, in your best hopes is gonna be five, six, seven, eight years long, to get to the mystery, you're gonna have to be going so far away of yeah. avoiding getting to the end. And, you know, that led to a number of conversations we all had, you, Joel, me, we all had the conversations about creating these mini arcs right. where you would make some kind of progress without fundamentally impacting the overall part of the show and what we were doing.
But for the internet people and the diehard fans of the show and the people that I was communicating with, there were the clue heads, the people who saw the show, and this episode begins to completely yeah. satisfy yeah. the clue heads. Of course, it begins to open questions that we couldn't possibly answer. Oh, yeah. You know, getting your own series on the air is a coup, whether it's yeah. on for one episode or 10 or years. And I came into the office on my show. I don't think you were here at the point, but you certainly experienced the back end of it. And, and, and I started to go for some coffee. And Stacy, my assistant, said, that's decaf. And I said, why is there decaf? I don't drink decaf. She said, oh, it's for, like, the editors. They made it. I said, well, when they get their series, <laughs> they can make their own, you know, effing coffee or whatever. So the next day I came into the office and there were two coffee machines and there was a sign over one that said, this is for non-decaffeinated. If you want decaffeinated, get your own effing series. <laughs> do you remember That's that? Funny. Yeah, remember that sign? It yeah. hung there for a long time. It was did. great. We had a good time. Gemini's That's funny. It was nice to have the editors just out in the garage. Oh, absolutely. It was an ideal setting, too. Yeah, I mean, so that, so, house, so people know, know what we're talking about. Yeah. When they asked us to find offices to do the show, I was, I smoked cigarettes, I had a dog, I didn't want to work in one of these offices where I was unhappy. So we rented a house, and uh, the bedrooms became offices, and the main areas of the living room and stuff were... Uh, the the pit with the assistants and stuff and the editors were in the garage but it was always very funny because when actresses were told by their agents that they had an audition they were always told don't get freaked out because it's you're going to be house. driven you're going to a house you know all you need is these attractive women like being said oh come to 1414 mockingbird lane you know and walk through the front door so everyone you know, then the delivery guys would walk in and see the desks and the zero and go, wow, from outside, this looked just like a house. <laughs> hey, Barney Miller. Hey, Blinken, we were just talking about right. him outside. That's funny. So, yeah, the clue heads, you know, they were all, supposedly there's going to be some big payoff to Tom finding out who those hanging bodies were. Right, right. And that they were all these important... I took a photograph of four of Senator Wallace's colleagues I think he might be interested in. See, Bruce was in a good place. He's looking a little yeah. haggard. His hair was longer. He's been playing the role. He's worn down a little bit. Nice shot. Yeah. This, nice is a, shot. this was a nicely shot episode. The episode itself was nicely shot. It, it still amazes me how much bang yeah, right. for the buck. Peter, yeah. Peter of in concert with Jim and the directors could get us. I mean, when I think of some of the things in Through a Lens, the taxi cab scene. Yeah. I mean, I have no doubt I'm in Northern Ireland. Yeah, it feels like a little feature. Yeah. It really does. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. not a little feature. It feels like the quality yeah. feature. Yeah. This picture, you have it with you? Yeah, I have a print of it, yeah. All right, you let me see it. If I think it's worth the senator's time, we'll move on to the next step. You know, if Nowhere no Man and what it was really about was about politics, I was saying this before, but it would be so easy, just an easy explanation. You now understand it. You could get the bad guys and life would go on. Yeah. It don't work like that. Yeah. No. No. Huh. It's funny too because I get the whole thing of paranoia in this show, <coughs> but I don't think of it as paranoid. I think of it as real. You know, I just I never thought of the show as paranoid. Then UPN came up with that. Yeah, I used the word existential. They call yeah. it a paranoid thriller. Yeah. <laughs> God, sounds like uh, harbingers to the pilot, Larry Levy's office. What happened to your assistant, Doug Iverman, today? 
Cut to the chase, Mr. Vale. Did you kill him? Well, of course not. I wouldn't be calling you if I had. But I was there when he was shot. What is this all about? <laughs> the most I can tell you is it's about a photograph. I, I was trying to show him a copy of it when it You know, happened. you can see here, you can see here, like, like the attempt to, like, okay, bring in three days of the Condor-esque right. elements. So at least, like, okay, is, is, is espionage the genre? Is that the genre here? And I remember, you know, you know, thinking, okay, it isn't the genre, but maybe if we do a little bit of that. It'll help. Yeah, it'll help. And, uh. You know, it's it's funny. It's like there's a there's a lot of this episode that I like, but there's a lot too that I see it being like you know last ditched attempt to sort of bring them to the party as opposed right. to us making the changes. Because I sort of knew, I think unconsciously, long before this point that we were never going to be able to come to them like with there was no answer. It was just like that again. You know, if you're making an existential thriller and you stop to take the existential part out. Right. And there isn't a, you take the riddle away from it. Right. Boom, the show's over. Right. We, weren't, we weren't a procedural show. We weren't a cop show, as Stan wanted us to be. But we weren't also a spy show. We weren't doing, no. you know, no. the spy thriller of the week either. And that's what, what really finally sort of threw them, I think. We were probably doing something we shouldn't have been doing. We were very naughty. Yeah. yeah. We were. Mr. Vail. But had fun, as most people who are being naughty, I guess, often do. Let's do this without making Yeah, we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. I guess he's going to the principal's office now. He's clean. I'll call you if I need you. He's just making sure. He wants to actually find out what happened. For a while, anyway. Satisfied? Mr. Vail, he's a bit close. <laughs> I'm entitled to be a bit cautious. You know, one thing that I always found, and it's interesting how in this particular episode, we're generally just talking about general things because the show had sort of left the gate. Yeah. But um, when, the, when the people saw the pilot and then some of the successive episodes, you think about it, some of them were very emotionally kind of shaken up. Right. You know, I saw the pilot I needed to, like, go... Take a Valium or have a right, drink or da, right. da, da. and you realize how untelevision yeah. that is because the average person rightfully wants to come home. Man, it's been tough enough out right. there all day long fighting the things Tom Bale fights, whether you know it or not. And then you come home and you're, you're sitting in traffic and you just want to, you know, you want to turn on like you want to Monday night football, football. or Desperate you know, Housewives. Yeah, beers and beer and babes yeah, and stuff. Exactly. And we're doing this show that. You come home and it upsets you. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, and the best episodes were the most upset. Right. Strange they never picked it up, huh? Yeah. Are you trying to blackmail me? Is that what this is all about? No, I'm just trying to get to the truth. I mean, there's obviously something rotten going on around here. I mean, your assistant was shot this morning. Quite a few of my staff are convinced that you're responsible. Actually, Tom said that in the truth and in the pilot. He says, when someone says wonderful pictures, he says, hey, you know, I, I just record. You know, they're beautiful. As if he's just the recorder right. of things. And it's one of the things about Tom that I think he's mistaken. Yeah. You know, I, and when we did explore his flaws in, in Through a Lens a Little Bit and then in the yeah. Maria Bello show, um, yeah. the... Uh, you know, I feel bad for him because I so respect him and I think he's such a hero. But I feel he's a little naive yeah. believing there is a truth to get to. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I think, too, that this is the episode. It's like it's hitting you over the head that there's a truth to get to. Right. You know, and I remember at this point you were starting to emotionally check out because you'd been beaten down for so long by these guys. And I kind of remember wanting to rally the thing. And, but... It's, it's ironic that this thing we're hearing now is like the truth, the truth. To me, that's even though it's here and I'm throwing this, sh this shit in some of it for whatever part I wrote because I don't remember right. who wrote Sorry. what now. But my whole, my idea of like You Gemini, wrote the stuff that sounds smart and I wrote the stuff <laughs> that sounds paranoid and emotional. That's probably how we could figure it out. You always had like people quoting great things. I go, where does art get this right now, stuff? You've got the Ravens you know?
Yeah, I don't remember who wrote what. I don't either. But I do remember the idea, in my mind, thinking Everything of like, Gemini is like perfect. Oh, Gemini yeah. Oh, absolutely. Perfect. Because even if Tom at some point, it's like, you know, the great thing in, uh, uh, what's the Hitchcock film, North, North by, by Northwest, where, you know, the other man's identity. Right. And, and there is no identity. Right. It was a false I identity. Right. Cary Grant, for a while, assumes that identity, right. you know. And I always thought there was a way for us to do that, you know, that Tom, but Tom consciously decides to assume, you know, but to get to that. Even, well, that like, was, I think, something we talked about for if season two had happened. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, that he would but take on the persona. we started to kind of like deal with, to just feel them out in this, before that, but in this episode here. And again, it was a huge miss because even that was too, too cerebral or too visceral. Either way, it wasn't like, packaged enough. It wasn't pre-sold. It wasn't like, that's still not telling us what the show is. Right. You know, you can say right. for a whole season then, he plays the game like Cary Grant. Yeah, maybe for a whole season he does that, you know? We don't right. know. Or at least for an arc, you know? Right. That would have been cool. And that's where we were, and that's when, at the same time, as you were more aware than I was, they had already made their decision. Right. God, look at those discs. Try to fit one of those into your cell phone. <laughs> Same exact look and the way he holds the gun as he did in the pilot at the end when he had the Padre at gunpoint. This must be pretty important stuff. To send the number two man at the FBI to destroy it, huh? Well, look, guy must have, he, after this, he got a job at Arthur Anderson. You're not gonna be able to change anything. <laughs> you call the deaths of five senators a little operation. Five dead senators? That sounds like the ravings of a crazy man, Bale. Very Bellamy-esque in its own way. Yeah. See, this is very untom Vale. Right. Very. We protect the very, very untom Vale. It becomes real. But why hidden agenda? Ow. That had to have hurt. That really had to have hurt. Do we have to pay him extra for that? Yeah, we did. Ooh, we did. It was a real bullet. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it must have been horrible. It was always as much about you as it was about concealing the deaths of four senators. It was about testing the limits of your belief. Okay, everybody you happy? He said it, and the show's over. You'll never see it again. Yeah. Why? Yeah, we're just happier. We know. Why we don't I care if we ever get to see Come it. Come on, Bill. You're two moves from checkmate. Now, I didn't necessarily believe I was right about how I was doing the show. It was just the way the show was designed, and that's what we were doing. But now that I watch this, I was right. About oh, what I, I believe. Doing. I mean, and I didn't even the think that then. Was you know, in terms of two of your the, the idiosyncratic part, nature of it, that's what made the show so different and so unique. Yeah. And you just can't. It was one of those shows. By taking that out, what do you have? You yeah, know? this is just like a low budge man on fire thing. Right, right, right. I actually, I'm surprised. I did. I'd forgotten how vi how violent this particular you know, scene was from Tom's point of view because right. he was never a guy who was. Right, I mean, he went after Bellamy with the, uh, you know, fake named uh, chemical. Right. But other than that, uh, go ahead, put it in, Tom. Now you get to see it. The world gets to see it. Oh no, save one of those M&Ms for me. He's gone. Gemini Bale? The money's under the big W. Sorry, I can't. There's just part of me that... Here it comes. C 
serious explain game over yeah yeah let's start from the beginning this is your house in Evanston Illinois this is your beautiful wife Allison your best friend is Larry Levy that was the first time I've ever used as a writer my own first name for a character oh really yeah a little weird for me when I'm writing. Yeah, name I've is, never used more. My wife's yeah. name is Allison. But you notice I killed the guy. Yeah. So My that's for the therapist. That's Larry for the therapist Levy. to figure out. Well, I didn't. Yeah, Levy is. And what is your name? My oh. name is Thomas Vale. My name is Thomas Vale. See, folks. There's those of us who just think there's a lot more fun when you don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah, well, or, or again, you know, the other side of this is, why did this have to be the end? Uh, is this the end of anything? Well, it was never intended. Yeah, I mean, exactly. We, we, we exactly. knew we could go on from there. Yeah.